I'm Chris Alvarez, and welcome to Military History Inside Out, brought to you by War Scholar. We talk about military history from ancient to modern times and everything in between. You can find more podcast episodes, written interviews, war games, and the most detailed military history timeline on the web at warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com. We're on YouTube at warscholar1945. You can send comments and suggestions to info at warscholar.org. Thanks for listening. I'm speaking with Dr. Constantine Lagos, co-author of Who Really Won the Battle of Marathon. Thank you for speaking with me. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Chris. So first... It's my pleasure. Thanks. Um, so first, tell me, how did you get into um, studying and writing on this subject? Well, um, my studies were uh, in ancient history. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, I was familiar with, uh, of course, among other, other things, the Battle of Marathon, even though I, 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 I didn't do any research uh, until uh, a few years ago on the battle. Well, it all started uh, from uh, a visit I, I paid to the, uh, to the battlefield, uh, the, the, um, you know, what, what we thought was the battlefield. And um, uh, that's when I had my first uh, uh, questions about things that didn't seem uh, to be uh, r- right about the battle. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the um, traditional view of this. So uh, I started a research for a paper and then um, gr- uh, gradually turned out uh, to into becoming a book because a lot of evidence uh, accumulated through my research and uh, the, I published the result of the uh, my findings in, in a book in Greek in Greek mm-hmm. that was back in uh, the end of uh, 2015 so um, in a few days time on the 30th of January there'll be also uh, the English edition mm-hmm. uh, on, on my, you know, the, my book. Mm-hmm. It, start, it, it started by, uh, you know, a visit at the battlefield. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I, I didn't go there as a tourist. I went there because I did have, I wanted to clarify a few things uh, about the battle because um, I was familiar with the, you know, the, the there are various reconstructions of the battle, but I mean, the most uh, known and um, I saw that um, couldn't stand. So that that was that was the um, the beginning of my research. Mm-hmm. Have you studied other um, classical or ancient battles, or was this the first one uh, you've tackled? No. Yeah, that was the first one. Mm-hmm. How do you uh, lay out the book? Um, is it uh, thematic, chronological? How do you break it down? Well, my book is uh, almost entirely on the battle. Mm-hmm. So, um, well, of course, there is an introduction. Um, uh, there are a few things about, you know, uh, the the structure of the the Persian army, or about Greece uh, uh, just before the the beginning of the uh, the Persian Wars. Mm-hmm. Um, but it starts uh, with uh, with the um, at the beginning, when the expedition uh, Darius actually this is the second expedition against Greece commences. Mm-hmm. Um, you know everything that we know about this expedition. Um, as uh, you know, the uh, the navy went through uh, the Aegean. Uh, then we go to uh, you know Evia, Cocaristos, and uh, Eretria, mm-hmm. and then uh, it goes on to the battle. We see the preparation of the the Athenians, uh, the route that the Athenians took to uh, to go to to Marathon, mm-hmm. the camp, which is a very important discovery. Uh, it's the first time uh, that this book reveals. Uh, exactly where the camp is, mm. was and is. Uh, we're talking about the Greek camp. Okay. And uh, well, the good the good thing is that uh, it's in the condition that they left it in 490 uh, BC. Mm-hmm. It's almost as you know, no one has really touched this ever since. Mm-hmm. And then I move on to um, you know just be- before the the battle stalemate for a few days. Mm-hmm. Um, and then. Uh, we uh, discuss discuss the the battle, but before we go there, uh, my book also presents uh, all the uh, reconstructions um, made before various theories, mm-hmm. uh, which is the great mystery about the battle. That um, uh, and that's why we had all the, so many publications over the past uh, two hundred years mm-hmm. on the battle because of all these mysteries, the, these queries 
Um, and then um, I discussed with my co-author um, our reconstruction of the battle, which um, is based on the, uh, the most realistic uh, features. The, the result, how the result of this battle um, not really uh, strengthened uh, uh, democracy in Athens, which is quite important. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we always knew that, that the outcome of the battle, of course, um, you know, saved Athens and um, etc. But it has a connection with democracy, which uh, is uh, clarified in our book. How the, the fact that uh, the Athenians uh, and the Plataeans, but mostly the Athenians, won the battle, how this affected democracy. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that that's that's the the outlay of, of the book. So what what do you think were the uh, major errors made in previous reconstructions, and why do you think uh, those errors were made? Yes, yes. Um, well, we have the traditional uh, view of the battle uh, up until let's say 1960, 99% uh, of uh, uh, papers, uh, publications, books on marathon um, had this theory that um, the battle took place um, around four kilometers away from the sea, very close to a mountain range called uh, Bedeli. Um, Bedeli is one of the mountains of Attica. So uh, m most people and experts uh, thought that the battle uh, took place at Marathon, the the plain of Marathon, but very close to the to the edge of this mountain, because they thought that uh, the Persians wanted to go to Athens through uh, Mount Pedeli. Now, even in the earlier years, uh, there were experts that were against this theory that that you know the Persians would never try to attack Athens through Pedeli because the main uh, way to go to Athens for Marathon is uh, next to the sea. And actually, uh, the ancient uh, road, a cartwheel road has been discovered there. So even though uh, this was the most prominent uh, theory, mm. there were a few experts, even from the 18th century, no, the 19th century, that said that the battle seems to have taken place close to the seaside on, on the main route uh, that went from Marathon uh, to Athens uh, through a place called Mesoyea. Uh, so this is one uh, major point uh, that has to do with the uh, where, where the battle uh, took place. The other things, the other uh, features is the famous question about the Persian cavalry. Now, if this uh, the, this powerful arm of the Persian army did take part in the battle, or if it didn't take part in the battle. Now, mo again, most experts uh, thought that it didn't take part in, in, in the battle. Uh, there were even some that said that the uh, Persians evacuated the uh, cavalry before the battle. Uh, there were others that said that, okay, the Persians had cavalry, but they didn't use it during, during the battle. Mm -hmm. Now, um, in our book, among other things, We've found um, uh, very strong evidence, I can say even conclusive evidence, that the, that the cavalry not only took place, took part in this, the battle, but it was, uh, it was destroyed at the beginning of the battle. And that uh, Miltiades' uh, plan was to entrap the cavalry. Later on, we can, I can clarify the, these points. Okay. So we've got the cavalry. Well, now, first of all, we've got where the battle took place. Then we've got the cavalry. Another thing which is uh, very interesting is that, uh, again, 99% of experts claimed that the uh, Athenians uh, did not only had hoplites with them. Again, there were a few experts that's, that disagreed with this, mm -hmm. at this point, that they also took with them the, um, uh, the light armed, armed uh, soldiers with them. And again, we found evidence that proves them right. Hmm. So that the uh, the army of the, the Athenians, again, you do have Plataeans, but these were very few. Uh, the, the big body of the, the army were, were Athenians. Uh, we call it a Greek army because we, you do have Athenians and Plataeans uh, there. 
Now, the thing is that we found that um, the, the hoplites were only one third of the army. You've got two thirds. The army is composed of uh, light armed uh, men who mm -hmm. also took part in, in, in the battle. And to move on, uh, the famous camp, uh, as I told you, Chris, we found it with uh, proof. I mean, the place is there, the remains of the camp are there. And then we move on to a very important thing, the point that the famous uh, face of the battle in the marsh. Uh, now, in our book, we reveal that this uh, battle, this um, part of the battle, you can't call it a skirmish because it's the main part, the main phase of the battle, uh, took place not in the big marsh of Mar Marathon that people thought. Because Marathon has two marshes. Okay. Um, everyone thought that the, the face with the, with the marsh, the skirmish, no, the battle, was as the Persians were leaving, uh, were retreating to go back to their ships. Because the big marsh is very close to, to the beach where everyone agrees that the, the Persians had their ships. It's called Sinyas. So it's uh, at the northern edge of the, of the plain. But we've, we discovered that um, uh, this famous uh, battle in the marsh was not as the Persians were retreating, and so they were chased by the, um, the Athenians, mm -hmm. but it was, and they were entrapped there. So this is at the, it's at the start of the battle, that while they were attacking, uh, they were entrapped in this, uh, this marshy piece of land, which helped the Athenians to slaughter them. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing which is revealed in the book. And finally... I'm speaking with Dr. Constantine Legos, co-author of Who Won the Battle of Marathon. You can find him by Googling his name or checking the book out at Pen and Sword Books. If you like this podcast, please make sure you rate it on whatever podcast feed you're listening to it on. Also, please don't forget to follow, like, and comment at warscholar.org, on YouTube at warscholar1945, on Facebook at warscholar, on Twitter at warscholar, and on Instagram at Chris Alvarez Warscholar. Now back to the podcast. Um, the connection between uh, marathon and the strength, strengthening of democracy, because uh, Athens did have democracy before the battle. I mean, with Clisthenes uh, from 507 BC, you've got the uh, democracy for the first time, but what happens after the battle is that it becomes radical. And this is because um, the uh, the lowest class, which is called Thetas, mm -hmm. uh, suddenly, suddenly get major powers just after the battle, which they did not have possess before, or if they did possess them, they didn't exercise them. For example, ostracism. Uh, is something which starts after the Battle of Marathon, which is um, a tool used by the theaters against the uh, the politicians. That of course the politicians came from uh, the, the the highest class. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, also, uh, the fact is that you've got the people, uh, the the assembly, the demos, uh, judging uh, archons, uh, the the magistrates. I mean, this happens after the Battle of Marathon, and uh, the various other things that happen and uh, we found a connection between this uh, major these this major reform with the battle the fact was that uh, you had all these poor people uh, the theaters that took part in the battle so just right after the battle they got all these um, they their, their position um, became stronger not because they got these um, from uh, the wealthiest uh, Athenians from the aristocrats it's because they uh, were instrumental in defeating the Persians. So that's another very interesting thing that we've, um, our book uh, reveals mm -hmm. again. Okay. Yeah. Um, so are there, so the site that is generally considered um, the spot where the battle took place, are there memorials or, you know, museums yes, or anything? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, the, the famous uh, Marathon Mound, which is, it's been excavated, uh, is just uh, outside the entrance of this, uh, uh, where we say that the battle took place. Uh, now, the the actual battlefield is the entrance, 
of uh, this uh, route between um, Marathon and the plane behind Marathon, which is called Mesogea, which is connected directly to Athens. So you have a very um, uh, narrow pass. It's exactly like Thermopylae, mm-hmm. where in the entrance, the Athenians uh, buried uh, their dead there. We knew that the, uh, the, the, the dead were buried there because this mound, uh, the Marathon Mound, that uh, it was excavated 120 years ago. Where we claim that the battle took place, as I told you, Chris, we are not the first that we, we've come up with this claim. Mm-hmm. This is something which has been recorded by other experts. Uh, with The first one was called George Finlay. Now, Finlay is very famous as a scholar, mm-hmm. George Finlay, because he fought in the, the Greek Revolution. He stayed on in Greece, and um, he, uh, he was a very good historian. And he gave a lecture in uh, London in 1838, where he sa- said similar things to what we claim in our book about, about the battle, uh, where the battlefield is. But what happened then? Um, Evidence accumulated after 1838, pinpointing that this is the place where the battle took place. So our cl- we are not the first to claim that the Athenians fought the Persians in front of this entrance. It's, it's between um, a, a hill called Dagriyaliki and the sea in order to prevent the Persians uh, entering through this... Um, this narrow passage so that they could, could go on to, to Athens. Mm-hmm. Uh, but all the rest about the cavalry, uh, about the, the light-armed soldiers, and uh, of course the marsh, all that's new. Now, among other things, Finlay was also the first to pinpoint the exact position of the camp. Uh, that was something that no one else saw because uh, we didn't read... Uh, his paper and found made these discoveries. We made these discoveries and we happened to come across his paper, which means that you know, which we're very happy to see that mm-hmm. there was someone 180 um, uh, years ago mm-hmm. who came to the same conclusions as we did. Well, of course, the question is why didn't uh, experts, archaeologists, historians then um, uh, follow what uh, Finlay said? It was because when he made the, these discoveries, it was so, there was uh, the, the academic uh, community, everyone was uh, absolutely sure that the battle took place close to Bedeli, as I told you, which is uh, around four, uh, four kilometers from the place uh, we say now. And what they did was they didn't give absolutely no thought to, uh, to Finlay's um, uh, discoveries. And that's why, um, even though the, the bibliography about the, the battle is immense, uh, we're talking about you know hundreds of papers and books. Uh, only few later on refer to uh, to his uh, uh, research, even though he was a famous uh, person mm. at that time. Um, you mentioned so some of the differences that you find from the established um, understanding yeah. is the location. You, you mentioned yes. the Persian cavalry. Are there other things, maybe uh, numbers, numbers involved in the fighting? Yes, yes, yes. Well, uh, since, uh, um, as I said, that the um, the Athenians also had their um, light armor, armored, armed uh, men with them. We're mm-hmm. talking about um, uh, archers, uh, people with um, um, sl- slingers, um, or maja- javelins, uh, even even um, stone throwers. Now, all these people were two-thirds of the army. So uh, there were something like nine or 10,000 hoplites, which means that the army, uh, the Athenian army at Marathon, was probably uh, more than 20,000, uh, even 25,000 uh, men. Now, uh, which means that it's uh, two, twice or two and a half or three times uh, bigger uh, than, than we thought. But as I told you, Chris, uh, we are not the first that came up with this number. Uh, there are experts. Of course, all these are referred in, in our book. Our book has uh, has a lot of bibliograph- bibliographical references. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the, there are more than 20 
uh, people, um, that, again, as I told you, experts, that uh, claim that the number nine or ten thousand Athenians cannot doesn't does not apply. So the number of uh, let's say the Greeks was much bigger uh, than we the, than we thought, mm -hmm. um, which means that the armies that clashed at Marathon on the on the front did not have a very um, great difference in number, but the Persians were much, much uh, larger, their, their, their army, because they, they had their, the, the, the crews of their ships. Um, the minimum number of ships was 600 ships, and that those ships had uh, people on the oars, and they had uh, the, 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 the naval personnel. All these were free, uh, they were not slaves, mm -hmm. and they could fight as light-armed soldiers, and they did fight. So when you've got the, the battle at the beach, uh, most of the people, the Persians that uh, fought there were the crews of, of the ships. And of course, they did have a lot of people that were, even though they were not on the front, they had reserves. Because we know from other battles, uh, from the Persian wars, that the Persians did never involve all their armies uh, in a battle. Mm -hmm. uh, in contrast to the Greeks, that threw everything they had in a battle. I mean, even at the uh, during the last battle that took place on mainland Greece, during the Persian Wars, the the battle at Plataea, um, they had they held in reserve uh, many uh, tens of thousands of soldiers that did not get involved in the battle. So, uh, even though on the on the front line the numbers are not that different, the Persians have reserves, and which is the other thing which is very important is that they had. Cavalry, which um, we suggest it's probably 1,000 or 2,000 horses, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the Greeks did not have cavalry, so that all added to the uh, the, the the strength of the, the Persian army. Mm -hmm. Have there been recent um, archaeological discoveries that support your position, or are you just looking at what exists and reanalyzing it? It's the second. It's the second. There, okay. there wasn't a single archaeological discovery that, uh, let's say, we saw it, uh, we heard about it, and we came up with a theory. Mm -hmm. Everything was there. Uh, the difference is that, I said it before, and I want to repeat this, mm -hmm. our theory was not 100% um, born from us. Uh, there were many, many good experts that came up with various, uh, let's say, uh, features of um, what, what we have in our book. Of course, we refer to these, to these people. But what we did, which I think is the great strength of our book, is we connected the dots between various uh, discoveries, uh, theories. Uh, uh, as I told you, there were uh, experts that had already claimed that the location of the battle is where we said the battle took place. Uh, Finlay had found the camp. Again, uh, we, we, were not, we were not the first that found the camp. Uh, of course, when Finlay discovered it and uh, uh, let's say he didn't publish it he, he said that the camp is there and that's the evidence uh, but, but no one checked this out then mm -hmm. but one thing which is unique and um, which was not included in our Greek book because at that time we did not have the right to publish this but it will be in the English book the only thing which is uh, a new archaeological discovery is um, we found um, within uh, the area of the camp, the Greek camp, a very big inscription on, um, on a rock face. Now, this rock has been carved. It's got the shape of an altar. And on the side of it, there's a monumental rupestral uh, inscription, which experts have dated to the 4th century BC. This is uh, 100 years after the battle. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be connected with, uh, it's commemorative, it seems to commemorate something about the battle, in the sense that something took place there during the battle. Of course, as I told you, the inscription is not from 490 BC. It's it's much later, but it's unique because nowhere in uh, Attica, in eastern Attica, has uh, uh, an inscription been found carved on uh, on a rock face. This is an official inscription. It's not graffiti. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is quite interesting, but uh, this is not that we found this and said, okay, this is the camp. I mean, there are uh, 
everything points to this. There's there's a lot of evidence, and uh, many archaeologists worked there, hmm. doing their research without knowing that it was the camp. Uh, they excavated part of it. They compared it to other forts, etc. So we used all this uh, evidence. Mm -hmm. So the camp, I guess, um, is treated as just a, a Greek military camp in general by archaeologists, not a Well, <laughs> now I'll tell you what happened with this. As I told you, Finlay first found it and said, this is the camp. Okay. Now, it's got... Um, it, it, it's, it's an extensive uh, area. It's in a ravine mm -hmm. where um, next to it is a ridge, which this ridge overlooks Marathon. And it's got um, a huge rampart, uh, which is like 300 meters long. Um, so what they did was they fortified the edge of the ridge, which is the most, the key point overlooking Marathon, and also the that passage I told you. Uh, that's where the the commanding officers, the generals, uh, their staff were situated, so they could they could oversee where you know the Persians uh, were. Mm -hmm. And in the ravine, you had the rest of the army. You got, you got th the thousands, probably 20 or 25 or th even 30,000 men in the ravine. So uh, in various parts, you've got remains of what they tried to do was to flatten earth so they, they could uh, use this. They could put their tents there. Uh, there's an entrance. Uh, there's, a pa there's a passageway. And next to the, very close to the entrance, it was this, the, the, the rock face with the inscription there. Now, what happened was, uh, an, a Greek archaeologist called Sotiriadis, in, during the 1920s, actually 1926, without knowledge, having knowledge of uh, Finlay's um, uh, comments, found it. And he thought he found uh, the, the ancient town of uh, Marathon, with mm -hmm. the Acropolis on the top. Now, um, why didn't Sotiriadis uh, say, well, this is next to the, the battlefield, so it should be the Greek camp? Because, at the, as I told you at that time, everyone thought that the battle took place uh, uh, in another uh, part of uh, Marathon. Mm -hmm. So there was this guy who was an expert on uh, prehistoric Greece, Mycenae, Mycenaeans. Mm -hmm. He actually at one point worked with Sliman as a young archaeologist. Uh, who saw everything as Mycenaean. And he happened to find a Mycenaean grave, a, a tomb um, in uh, Marathon. So he thought, okay, this place over here must be the Mycenaean citadel, which was then used during class the classical times. Mm -hmm. Now, after him, archaeologists that came along to study this uh, went there to, to see if uh, Sotiriadis' uh, theory is correct or if it wasn't correct. So something like 40 years, uh, the archaeologists were trying to prove or disprove his theory. Now, they did disprove his theory, but then they didn't say, okay, this place is not Mycenaean. It seems to be archaic or classical. It's, it, it, it's a fort. Um, it's, a, it's a temporary uh, Greek camp. Mm -hmm. But is it connected to Marathon? I mean, no one said this question. Mm -hmm. Because if they had set this question, they would have come up with uh, with the right answer. Mm -hmm. So this is what happened with our, with our book, Chris. Mm -hmm. We had people coming very close to things like the Little Marsh. Now, this is very interesting that we had people that said, OK, it can't be the big marsh where the, 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 the fighting took place. But they they didn't consider the Little Marsh because someone had come along and said the, the, the Little Marsh did not exist during antiquity. And they took this as um, uh, do dogmatic. And it turned out that this guy was uh, not, it wasn't right what he, what he was saying, because geologists uh, found out that the, the Little Marsh is uh, from, from the pre prehistoric times. So it did exist during the, the Battle of Marathon. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, yeah, 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 that's it. I think sometimes um, uh, people are afraid to, you know, push alternative ideas against the mm. established one just because of reputation and you know are you going to get a job if you're considered a radical thinker or something like that you know? well i i'll tell you something on this point which um, is very interesting um uh, so who was a very 
famous archaeologist, a good archaeologist. He was actually the, the first professor, Greek professor, who held um, uh, a chair on archaeology in uh, the University of Athens. Because up until the, the um, mid-war years, there was only one university in, in Greece, Athens. Mm -hmm. So he was, he was the first um, professor of archaeology. But he was also the person that gave rights to foreigners to dig in Greece uh, dur during the, um, let's say, up until the, the start of the Second World War. Mm -hmm. So he, he issued the, the permits. Now, a very famous American archaeologist called Vanderpool, Eugene, who for many years later was the, um, the head of the American uh, uh, School of Classical Studies in, in Greece. We're talking about very... Uh, the other thing, uh, Chris, bear in mind that the people that did all these research in Marathon are the top of the top of archaeologists. I mean, uh, the name Pritchard is very famous. Mm -hmm. He did a lot of work at Marathon. Uh, Macridi, and um, there's uh, and German archaeologists, and, but, and of course Greek archaeologists. I mean, the, the most famous Greek archaeologists worked at Marathon. But to come back to Vanderpool, so Vanderpool, Vanderpool, as a young archaeologist during the 30s, I was pretty sure that the location of the battle was not where people thought, as I told you, close to Bedelli, mm -hmm. but where I, you know, in, in this passage, I say. Now, he found concrete evidence on this. Uh, it was um, uh, inscriptions and various other things m uh, mentioning Heracles. Now, uh, Herodotus, in his um, narration of the battle, says that um, the sanctuary of Heracles where, was where the Athenians had camped. So, in 1930, an inscription was found that mentioned the, the worship of Heracles. Now, uh, Vanderpool published this, but at the, at the time he published it, he didn't say that, okay, this find shows that the temple of Heracles saw the Athenian camp and the battle, of course, because the battle took place close to where the camp was, is in the southern part of the plain next to the passage. The reason why he didn't do this then was because Sotiriades was still alive, and Sotiriades was one of the fanatics claiming that the Battle of Marathon took place four kilometers away, because um, if someone came along and told him the battle took place here, that would disclaim his theory that what he found was the Mycenaean uh, town of Marathon. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Theades dies during the Second World War. And uh, afterwards, Vanderpool revealed that I, at the time I, I didn't publish my theory, even though I had my theory even then, because I didn't want to upset Sotiriades. Mm -hmm. But the fact was that Sotiriades was the guy that gave permits to archaeologists to work in Greece. So it's exactly what you say, uh, Chris. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think that's the first time you've had situations like that with uh, many archaeological discoveries mm -hmm. and, and theories, you know, where you have clashes between young and old and established well, versus radical. I'm sorry, I, I, I must say this. Uh, it's the same with Finlay. Mm -hmm. Now, why Finlay, uh, his theory was um, discarded and no one then took any notice of it was because he clashed with again a very famous person called Leek. Now, um, Colonel Le Leek was the guy that, uh, when Greece was still under uh, Ottoman occupation in the early 19th century, traveled in Greece, and he was one of the first um, people to pinpoint where um, ancient sites were. He wrote extensively on this. He wasn't actually an archaeologist, because at the time you didn't have archaeology at the time, but he was a scholar that went along to see where the uh, the ancient um, sites were. Mm -hmm. And he was one of the people, the first people, that claimed that the battle took place in the wrong location. Mm -hmm. Now, so uh, Finley comes along, who's a generation younger than uh, Leek, and says, no, I disagree with this. Uh, I believe that the location is uh, in the southern part where the passage is. And Leek bombarded him, and he, he wrote back a crit critique on his on Finlay's theory, mm -hmm. where even though they were friends, um, he completely buried uh, Finlay about this. So this this has a long history in, in Marathon. Mm -hmm. 
And just to clarify for listeners, um, something yeah. you said that there weren't archaeologists back then. I believe what you mean is that it wasn't established as a field of study, yes. but you did have yes, people yes. digging things up and yes. writing on yes. them. Yeah, yes, but it wasn't, as we say, um, you know, scientific uh, field yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I'm speaking with Dr. Constantine Legos, co-author of Who Won the Battle of Marathon. You can find him by Googling his name or checking the book out at Pen and Sword Books. If you like this podcast, please make sure you rate it on whatever podcast feed you're listening to it on. Also, please don't forget to follow, like, and comment at warscholar.org, on YouTube at warscholar1945, on Facebook at warscholar, on Twitter at warscholar, and on Instagram at Chris Alvarez Warscholar. Now back to the podcast. So what other um, objects, archaeological objects, exist um, about the Battle of Marathon? Is there a lot of, um, you know, a lot of weapons and armor bits and pieces around? Like what other stuff out there is there? Well, because the battlefield hasn't been excavated, and neither has the camp, because I told you that the the archaeologists uh, did uh, research the camp, but they didn't, uh, maybe I said excavation, they didn't actually excavate the place there. They made surface surveys there. Uh, you, we don't have that many weapons around. I mean, there are very, very few weapons. Um, there's a famous uh, helmet in Ontario, in the museum, the Royal um, Ontario Museum, which uh, people claim comes from the Battle of Field of Marathon, but that was found, uh, at, it wasn't found in an excavation, and it's not sure that this is uh, from the Battle of Marathon. Uh, we do have a lot of um, arrowheads, bronze arrowheads, mm-hmm. that seem to come from the Battle of Field of Marathon. Uh, incidentally, these are Greek arrowheads, they're not Persian, mm-hmm. but it's uh, not that we have many, many relics from the battle, but there is a very important uh, artifact uh, linked to the the battle, which uh, does not come from Marathon. Uh, This is from uh, a temple on the Acropolis, uh, uh, called the the Athena Niki temple. It's that pretty little uh, Ionic uh, temple where someone um, uh, climbs the Propylaea, it's on, on, on your right hand, and uh, it has uh, friezes, uh, this um, uh, temple. Now, the southern frieze, uh, all experts agree that it portrays the Battle of Marathon. About 150 years ago, there was only one uh, scholar that said maybe it's Platea, but now everyone agrees, the experts agree, that the scenes there are uh, a visual portrayal of the, ma- the Battle of Marathon. Mm-hmm. Now, if you go to the British Museum, where there are parts of the frieze there, or you go to the Acropolis Museum in Athens, I mean, this part of the frieze, you've got half of the frieze in the British Museum, the other half is in Athens. Now, the the signs say the Battle of Marathon. Now, now what do we see in this frieze? We see the Persian horses attacking Athenian hoplites and light-armed uh, soldiers, and the, the horses being stopped because of the environment. Uh, there's actually one horse that it's as if experts say, this is not mine, this comes from the experts, that it, it's fallen in a marsh because it's broken its uh, two front uh, legs. Mm. Uh, and it's, it's a chaotic uh, scene where you can see that it's marshy from the way that the uh, sculpture shows the, um, uh, the environment. Mm. So you've got uh, Persians falling from horses, Persians lying on mud, uh, hoplites attacking the Persians, and uh, also light-armed uh, Athenians, um, Greeks fighting. Now, this thing is dated to 426, 427, uh, 27 BC. Mm-hmm. Now, it's only six decades after the battle. Right. So, it's, it's before uh, you have uh, in uh, literature um, people saying various things about the, the you know, myth, mythical things. Mm-hmm. When the battle was still alive, you even had veterans still living. Um, so it, it seems to be a very um, realistic uh, portrayal of what the battle, how the battle was fought, which mm-hmm. agrees 100% with our theory. 
Uh, but again, before that, in around 460, which is even earlier, there was a portrayal of the Battle of uh, Marathon um, in a famous um, work of art in Pikili Stoa, which was described by Pasanias, a famous uh, Greek traveler who saw this uh, this painting, was a painting. And there's references to, uh, uh, to the marsh and the Persians being uh, entrapped in, in a marsh. In this, in this, in this piece of, we, of course, this work has not survived, but we've got the description. Mm -hmm. So we've got we've got the two works of art. One for thirty years after the battle, the other, the other one sixty years after the battle, mm -hmm. showing things which Herodotus doesn't describe in his um, description of the battle, mm -hmm. and which agree with uh, with our theory. Mm. That's fascinating. Are, yeah. Well, thank you, Chris. Are there any? Um... Are there any Persian writings or records of the battle? No, no, uh, none exist okay. about uh, the battle. Uh, there's only this, uh, I mean, Datis, who was the, uh, the, the, the one of the two commanders, the other one was uh, Atafernis. Uh, there's, we're talking about something which is well known, it's been well documented. There's, uh, in Persepolis, there was um, um, a clay tablet found uh, recording his name and uh, it shows that he was a high official of Dari Darius, and just before the Battle of Marathon, before the expedition, uh, he was on a very important mission uh, to Darius. But that's it. We don't have any reference to the Battle of Marathon. But uh, honest, I think that generally about the Persian Wars, I mean, even the famous battles of uh, Thermopylae and uh, uh, Salamis and uh, Plataea, uh, I think that they're, they're not, not e no even uh, there's the no mention of these battles uh, in Persia, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken about this. But for Marathon, I'm 100% sure about this. Hmm. What part of the research uh, did you find most enjoyable? Ah, that's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, um, well, of course, um, our book, the first chapters, deal with uh, known facts. That's where we actually didn't add something new. Mm -hmm. uh, when the, the expedition was launched, and uh, the, then they they sailed the the Aegean, they had various um, conquests on the work, on the on, on the way there. Uh, then they went to Eretria. Um, well, I can't say that this was boring because even the even you know there were small details that had to be clarified. But well, the the very enjoyable parts of the book, of course, were uh, our discoveries. Mm -hmm. I mean, the the major thing was the camp. Well, um, I'm pretty sure that anyone that reads the book will be convinced that this is the camp of Marathon. Mm -hmm. um, with all the the, um, the bibliographical references to this, the battle itself, which is um, a very quite exciting um, uh, chapter. Mm -hmm. Ah, I had to add here that one thing that really helped us was that um, um, the geolo geological discoveries show that the terrain of the of Marathon has changed very little since the time of the battle, which hmm. was very important. It's not the, the same case, let's say, for example, Thermopylae, where if someone goes now to the passage there, it's not uh, a, a narrow passage, it's like three or four kilometers, It's uh, because it's it has changed. But in the case of Marathon, I'm talking about the battlefield. Mm -hmm. um, there have been very, very little changes there. And uh, we were lucky uh, because there have been several um, studies at Marathon. There, there was a great con controversy uh, back in the beginning of 2000 because then Athens was to hold the, um, the Olympic Games in 2004. And the uh, Olympic, um, you know, where the rowing thing, you know, the, it took place. They wanted to build it in, in Marathon, close to the big marsh. Mm -hmm. So they had all these geologists to find out uh, what the environment was in uh, earlier centuries. And this can only be done by geologists, not archaeologists. Mm -hmm. uh, they can find out how, what, the, what the environment was like. And they discovered that uh, it hasn't changed that much and uh, that the marshes did exist, that the, the coast... The position of the coast in the southern part where the battlefield is has not changed. The northern part, it has changed a bit. It's, it's um, now the, it's further inland than what it used to be. Um, so all this was very, very exciting, gathering all this uh, evidence. Mm -hmm. 
from archaeology, from the from archaeology, geology, and most important of all is uh, the ancient um, references, because it's not only Herodotus. We do have other other ancient um, uh, literary sources, mm -hmm. and then it was uh, what people found, um, you know, scholars, uh, people, visitors. Uh, as I told you, during the Ottoman period, you had famous uh, people coming along and um, making discoveries that they recorded in their traveling um, books. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, the democracy thing, the question that it was, at one point, I'll tell you this, Chris, um, because I worked on my research for Marathon for almost 10 years, mm. uh, not 10 years, well, seven, eight years. It was, it was a passion. Now, I found out that uh, many things c came into place after we put together this evidence. It's like a puzzle where you, you, you've got a puzzle, you put your pieces together, and then it's very easy to put the rest of the puzzle together. The thing about democracy, mm -hmm. um, even though people, many people that have read the book in Greek claim that that's the, they think that's the best of all, was the easiest to write, mm -hmm. that final chapter because everything was in place uh, about the battle. And then we come to, to democracy. And uh, this is important that democracy, the, the radical form, because uh, up until the Battle of Marathon, uh, as I told you, you did have, you did have, um, you know, Athens was a democracy, but it did have a lot of aristocratic uh, features. It, become, it becomes radicalized uh, because of um, the, the fact that the, the lower class took great power Mm. in its hand. And everyone thought it was because of Pericles. Now, Pericles is uh, something like 40 years after the battle. Mm -hmm. Now, the only thing Pericles did was uh, he paid the poorer citizens so that they could um, uh, go to the assembly and also be on uh, the uh, the courts as, um, as uh, juries, because these courts also heard cases against the, uh, the the magistrates because the magistrates were the, were the rich guys mm -hmm. now but this existed before now I, I don't say that under Pericles democracy was not you know what, what it was but Demo uh, Pericles found most of the the established thing already in place mm -hmm. and this happens just after marathon uh, so that was a very exciting uh, chapter because it doesn't have to do with military history now it's because of military history that we've moved on to uh, political history, social history. Mm -hmm. So I'm really proud about this. Yeah, that is pretty cool. Um, oh, th thank you. Thank you, Chris. What, um, so we've talked about things that you've discovered in your research, but was there anything that we haven't mentioned that was most surprising that you came across? Ah, oh, no, yeah, okay, I'll tell you. I'll tell you this. And... Of course, everything I'm telling you is in the book. So when people have the book, we'll be able to read this with all the evidence. Mm -hmm. There were these very, um, very good scholars. Now, most of these were Germans um, that at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. Now, the, why do you have uh, two generations of very good um classical scholars in Germany, because there was a guy called Ernest Curtius. Now, Ernest Curtius is, um, he was a, a professor of ancient, uh, on ancient Greek. He was the first German who wrote, uh, let's say, a scientific book on Greek history mm -hmm. in the 1850s. Now, he lasted until the end of the, the, you know, the late 19th century. So he had um, um, students that followed in his tracks. Now, these, this group of German scholars were the people that supported uh, Finlay's theory about the fact that the battle took place in the southern part, that its location was in the passage between uh, Agrieliki and the sea. But they didn't notice this detail from Finlay that the, the camp was uh, on top of the ridge. Because uh, Finlay simply said there are uh, remains of the camp on the ridge overlooking uh, the passage. Mm. Now, what's interesting is that all of these people, even though they never visit, they didn't visit Marathon, 
Uh, they claim that the camp should be on this ridge. It's it's ridge um, two or six. So that in meters, two or six. It's the two or six um, uh, meter ridge. Mm-hmm. And the fact was that even even though they claimed that the camp was there, and it it is where the the camp is, they based their theory purely that the fact that this is the the most strategic point uh, to guard against the, an invading army from Marathon to Athens. Mm-hmm. So I was had this uh, query that. It, if they knew about these remains, they could, you know, uh, publish the fact that uh, the remains are there. Mm-hmm. So th- this was quite uh, thrilling for me, the fact that, because I found the camp by accident, not by accident. Uh, I, as I told you, I hadn't read uh, Finlay, mm-hmm. so I had no idea about this fact. And it was at the beginning of my research, I came up on, what the, my theory was that the Batu was in the Little Marsh, which is in the passage, it's at the beginning of the pa- this passage. So I said, okay, the camp should be uh, on the ridge overlooking the passage. And I paid a visit there and saw that all these remains were there in place. Mm-hmm. So that's, very, that's really exciting that uh, these very, very good scholars came to the same conclusion as I did, let's say, well, it wasn't an accident in my case, but because, I, I, have, because I, I live in Athens, I can go to Marathon, visit Marathon, etc. Mm-hmm. And um, it's what I told you that... You know, when you you're right about something, everything falls in place. Then, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So, obviously, with archaeology and ancient studies, there are going to be a lot of questions you can't answer. But was yeah. there was there a, is there a question that you would really like to get an answer for, like some little bit that would be helpful, um, something that really just kind of uh, gnaws at you? Yes, yes. Well, the fact is that. Um, my research is finished, and the proof of this is that I published a book. Because usually, when your research finishes, you publish your book, your final findings. Mm-hmm. Now it's it's entirely up to the archaeologists, because first of all, as I told you, uh, Chris, we've uh, pinpointed exactly where the camp is. The camp, in many uh, parts, is uh, covered in um, uh, soil. So it could be excavated. You do have parts which are on, on the rock, where very little excavation can take place there. So it means that the archaeologists uh, should go and uh, start digging the place. And of course, the battlefield there. As I told you, uh, a big part of the battle took place in a marsh. Now, that ma- uh, actually, it's more like a pit bog than the marsh, which means that even though after the battle, uh, the Greeks did the, their best to recover the bodies of uh, the dead Persians and weapons, etc. Um, I'm pretty sure that this has a lot of artifacts, uh, this uh, this part. And the good thing is that th- this part of the marsh, even though the marsh was, what do you call it, it, w- it was um, became earth. Uh, <laughs> it was, um, I'm just trying to remember the English word. It was, um, you know, when you have a marsh and you turn it into earth, uh, um, yes, I forget the word. Yeah. 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 Well, anyway, uh, a big part of it is still marshy, which means that um, it hasn't it wasn't built over. So it, it can be excavated. Uh, hmm. So the, I'm looking forward to, you know, ne- the, uh, the coming years, mm-hmm. archaeologists to find all these nice weapons we were talking about and um, finding out more things about the camp, because in my book, what I did was I brought out features of the of the camp, which show that it, it it's a temporary uh, ancient Greek camp. But I'm pretty sure that even there, even though they stayed only for ten days, it was only for ten days that they used this place, mm-hmm. and that's one reason why the archaeologists couldn't find any um, ceramics uh, on the surface, because in ancient sites, what archaeologists find are the ceramic. Um, uh, the uh, pa- uh, pieces of uh, pots. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, the um, the rubbish. Right. And, and the, the, the very, very little ceramics there on, on the surface. Uh, but I, I'm sure that there will be many more finds. As I told you, this inscription we found, which mm-hmm. uh, uh, so many archaeologists, good archaeologists that visit the place, happened not to see this, this inscription, which was by accident that we, we discovered. So Marathon, even though our, our book brings this, um, this new theory about the battle, 
uh, the research uh, only starts now, and it, it will be conducted by it will be done by archaeologists. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm curious if anyone listening to this might be inspired to uh, take you up on the challenge. And uh... well, yeah, I'll tell you, Chris. Um, since the book is coming out in English, mm -hmm. because English, of course, is uh, the world language. Mm -hmm. When I, our book came out um, uh, four years ago in Greek. Unfortunately, um, Greek is not what it used to be in antiquity. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the lingua franca. Right. Um, you, know, you know, Greek now is uh, you know it's used by few people, and uh, Greece is a small country. Uh, so um, we are pretty sure that um, now, since we've got the English version of uh, the book, uh, there'll be much more interest in our theory. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, the other thing is, well, I I'm very sure that we. We'll, the place will have visitors, because it does get visitors. But these are, you know, few Greeks that happen to to have heard the theory, have read the book. Mm -hmm. But now, um, even as we speak, it is a very impressive place there, because most of the remains are still there, because they built their fort, that rampart, uh, on uh, on on a ridge, which is uh, it's rock, so. Most of it is hasn't been covered by uh, soil. Mm -hmm. It it remains intact because you d didn't have a village close by, so people could go and take the the stones, uh -huh. build um, uh, build uh, houses. Uh, it, it wasn't cultivated, so it wasn't in a field. So you know farmers can come along and destroy this in order to to cultivate the land, right. and not even sheep can graze there, because it's so it's. It, it's a place which is, um, uh, as I told you, it's, it's, it's rock face, this place. It does have a ravine, but mm -hmm. even this ravine, uh, it's not used to, for, by, um, uh, you know, for sheep to, to graze because it's, um, it's not good for grazing. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's left uh, untouched there. And, mm -hmm. of course, the, the place, people will, will visit it because uh, Marathon is, as you know, it's a, it's a famous um, it's very famous because of the marathon uh, thing, oh, yeah. and uh, you, 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 of course, you don't have the tourists that visit um, the Acropolis in Athens or Delphi, Olympia, um, you know, or Knossos. These are uh, or roads. These are ancient sites that um, attract uh, millions of tourists. But you do get, um, let's say, tens of thousands of tourists going to marathon, especially to this m mound I told you, where which is the the graves of the Athenians. Uh, mm -hmm. which people visit there. There's a very good museum also, a small museum, very good museum. And uh, I'm pretty sure that people that will visit Marathon in the, in the coming years will also pay a visit to the camp, which mm -hmm. is, uh, it is, you know, it's on, 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 on a ridge, which means that you have to walk uphill. It's not as if you're going to climb. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not that difficult to, to approach, but, you know, it's a... It, it is um, uh, it's a uphill um, walk there, yeah. and that's why exactly they built their fort there. So right. you, uh, the ancient yeah. Greeks built their temporary camps on uh, on hills, hills uh, ridges. It wasn't like the Romans and the Persians that built th those th their camps in uh, on the plains. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Did you have uh, so during the course of your research? Did you have any? Uh... Anything that uh, impacted you emotionally, that had a strong emotional effect on you? Well, I was very excited when I first went to the camp, to be honest, because um, as soon as I saw the remains, I was pretty sure that this was the camp, even though, as I told you at that time, I wasn't familiar with the bibliography yet. Uh, but seeing where, the, where the, the, the place was, the remains were, uh, it was touching because it's... You get the feeling that the, these people, the the Athenians and the Plataeans, left it only yesterday. Hmm. So let's say it's got this eerie feeling. Uh, uh, at the time when I went there, you didn't have uh, people coming along. Now, if you go there, you will see occasionally people that want to to come and see it. But uh, it was eerie because you didn't have any any soul alive around there. You got from the plane of Marathon, you could hear the noises. Uh, because of uh, where, the point, where this point is, it's at the end of the edge, the plane, the southern edge. 
um, you hear the the noises coming along. You can't distinguish the noises, mm-hmm. but um, it's as if they're, they're carried by the wind. Mm-hmm. So you're on the top, and you, you you hear these noises. Now, this is touching what I'm going to, to tell you, Chris. Mm-hmm. When I was then doing my research, I found a reference by uh, a Greek uh, orator who lived during the Roman period called Elius Aristides, who does mention uh, the Athenians at their camp. And he made a mention uh, that they had the same feeling I had when I was in the camp, that the Athenians were hearing strange noises from the Persians in the plain uh, that were uh, coming to their ears. Hmm. Uh, that, so that was that, 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 that was touching. And uh, as I told you, um, this is a place where it's not as impressive as the Parthenon, for example. But I'm going to tell you something which might si- sound um, uh, too far-fetched for your listeners. <laughs> go, go, it's, go. Much more, it's much more important than the Parthenon because this is the place uh, that uh, starts the, you know, everything that comes after Marathon. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's a sacred place because it's the camp. You, you don't have dead there, of course. It's not, they, they buried their dead there, but it's where they were for 10 days, the, the, the Athenians and the Plataeans. Mm-hmm. And um, it's as if you're in the, uh, where uh, Miltiades and Kalimachos were there. There's a famous um, uh, discussion that Herodotus uh, records just before the battle that um, Miltiades tried to convince Kalimachos and he's recorded what he thought were the words of Miltiades. Of course, there were no tape recorders at that, at, at that time. Right. But he has Miltiades talking to Kalimachos. And uh, we're pretty sure that this exchange took place on top of the ridge where the, the remains of the fort is and uh, where the generals had this great view of the plain and the, uh, the passage next to the plain and um, it's as if you're in the footsteps of history mm-hmm. um, entirely there. So, yeah. yes, that, 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 that's touching, uh, Chris. Yeah, as you spoke, I, I almost imagined myself standing on the ridge and hearing the shouts in ancient Greek and, and Persian, you know, and the clash yeah. of arms and, and all that. I, you know, just I can imagine that. Yes, and uh, what's interesting is, um, uh, of course, I've taken friends up there, uh, some... Uh, uh, you know, people in the military or um, diplomats or professors. Uh, we're talking about people, uh, you know, cultivated people that have read about the battle, know many things. Because in Greece, uh, we have this that uh, it's not only people, historians and archaeologists, but generally, um, let's say, people with um, cultured people have a great interest in uh, in uh, our, you know, ancient history. And that, of course, makes sense. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, these people were very moved uh, being up there. There was actually a general uh, in the Air Force, ex-general, who when I first told him about the camp, because he was born in Marathon, and he grew up there as a, as a, as a young kid, he knew that, yeah, of course, we know that there's a fort up there. But he didn't actually tell me to my face that it can't be the camp. But I could see that he was puzzled by this. And I said, okay, come along, and uh, let's go. have you ever been up there? He said, never, I've never been up there. So let's go now. Let's go up there. And when he went up there, he said, you're absolutely right. Because when someone is, looks, uh, is, is in the plane and looks up on the top of the ridge, it's not that impressive. But when you're up here, you can understand that this is the perfect place where they had to make their temporary camp to... Um, so they can watch over the Persians. And um, But he told me something really touching, Chris, that uh, this is really great, but I'm also upset because I had fantasized this place and yet generally the battle, and now you've brought it in reality. So mm-hmm. you've made this, like, this fantasy I had, and um, he was a bit upset by this. Hmm. Yeah, that's... <laughs> hey... I'm sorry, that's life. <laughs> I know, no, I know, Chris. I, I can understand uh, exactly. The, you know, I had the, sim- the, the same feeling. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, you know. I thought at first it was like you know it was funny, but it does make sense because it's um, 
when you grow up, of course, the Battle of Marathon is probably the most famous battle in antiquity, one of the most famous battles uh, in, in mankind. Mm -hmm. It always makes the first 10 or 15 most famous battles ever. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you, you've got someone who's a general who's like in, in his 70s, who's he's been brought up ever since he was in uh, kindergarten about the battle. And he was born in Marathon mm -hmm. because there's a, there's a modern city in Marathon. N nothing to do with the battle. It's like it's uh, 10 kilometers away from the battlefield, the, the city. And uh, it's always uh, a fantasy because he on, the only pictures he's seen were um, imaginary Picture, pictures of the battle and he comes along along and sees the real thing mm -hmm. and he says okay this it's it's not as it, it's, it's it is impressive the camp but it's you know expect it a bit different and say okay this is it this you you have to uh you know uh, you know accept this because this is reality mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah what would the weather have been like do you think um at the battle at this time during uh, the yeah the weather would have been, um, it, it's at the end of summer. Uh, there are no references to, of course, in uh, any of our ancient sources about what the weather was like. Mm -hmm. But generally, it was good weather. Mm -hmm. We're talking, it's not extremely hot, but um, it's people can stay outside. They can, of course, sleep uh, in, um, you know, outdoors. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, uh, maybe there were some hot days, but generally, terrible uh, conditions during the battle. But you don't have any any rain or thunderstorms or, of course, no snow. Now, the battle took place on the 11th or 12th of September. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'm thinking, you know, if you were on the ridge viewing the area, you know, would you see dust clouds as the Persians were moving? And, you know, yes. like I'm just imagining. Yes, that's, uh, that's exactly what happened. Uh, we do have references from ancient sources that they viewed the Persians from their camp, and uh, this um, brought terror to the Athenians. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's a reference by Herodotus that um, when uh, the, um, those generals that didn't want to fight, because we're, we're talking about well-known uh, stories now, mm -hmm. uh, you, have, you have ten generals, and five of them said, okay, we shouldn't fight now, we should uh, the battle, because the Persians are, 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 too, are so many. Now, um, and uh, you have uh, these thousands of people on the plain. Well, most of them were close to the beach, which is further inland, but you could see the ships there. And uh, uh, the Persians had the entire plain where they, before the battle, they, they, they controlled the plain because they had also uh, cavalry. And uh, and uh, it wasn't only the, the generals, but also the soldiers that could see all the, the you know, the dust clouds from from the the Persian horses or you know the men moving along, as I told you, the the, the Persians, uh, the frontline troops may not have been so different in, in numbers to the the Greeks. We're talking about around twenty five or thirty thousand, mm -hmm. but uh, a minimum of a, you have a minimum of one hundred thousand uh, people that have to support those thirty thousand. So if you have one hundred thirty thousand people in a plane which is Okay, it's not a, a very small plane, but it's not a big plane. It's got a width uh, of uh, seven to eight kilometers. So we're talking about a lot of people, and this would have uh, impressed negatively the uh, the Greeks on the ridge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you have? So you said uh, it's been seven or eight years of research. Um, mm. What difficulties did you have in getting finished and published? Yes, yes. Uh, well, the greatest difficulty was this huge volume of uh, bibliography. Mm. I mean, it's incredible how many people have written about Marathon, the Battle of Marathon. Uh, in our Greek edition, we have something like um, uh, around seven or eight hundred items, oh. books, articles, um, discoveries, uh, what not. And... Uh, um, because I did most of the uh, bibliography, my co-author uh, contributed in uh, other spheres of the of the edition. So um, I personally, I had to read everything, and going through uh, seven, eight hundred uh, different publications is, is a lot of work. There, yeah. 
And um, so that was the the greatest uh, task. Mm -hmm. uh, the theory is theory. Um, of course, um, there were many, many different details that we had to find out, mm -hmm. but mostly it stuck. Um, the fact was that, especially with the Little Marsh, which is uh, pivotal in our theory, all the evidence supports this. And in this case, it's not like wishful thinking that you come along as uh, Sotiriadis, let's say, Sotiriadis found um, a Mycenaean grave. So he said, okay, now I'm looking for a Mycenaean Acropolis. And he comes along and finds the camp, says, okay, this is the Mycenaean Acropolis. Um, I was very, very careful that things that I imagined, I thought, that uh, these had to be proved by scientific evidence or, or disproved. Uh, but coming along, doing all this research, added a, a, a lot of new evidence. For example, the Athena Niki that Frieza told you, which is very important about the, the battle, mm -hmm. uh, was something I found towards the end of my research. And uh, it came to cement or, or the rest. Mm -hmm. Did you have any difficulty getting a publisher? No, no. Okay. Uh, I, this may sound... Um, I don't want to show off, uh, Chris, uh, but <laughs> I've written, <laughs> I've written three books in Greece because I'm I'm Greek. I'm, of course, I live in Greece. Mm -hmm. I've never knocked on a publisher's door uh, okay. because my first book, uh, because I'm a historian, uh, I did my PhD on ancient history, but then I went on. I I teach in uh, military uh, academies. I've been teaching in the. Air Force Academy, the Hellenic Hellenic Air Force Academy, for close to twenty years now. Okay. Well, my main subject is aviation history. <laughs> okay. No, my yeah, my first book was about the Second World War, the the German invasion of Greece, and uh, with new finds I made about the invasion of the, the Greeks. So a publisher came along, and asked me, um, "Do you want to publish this?" I wasn't really prepared for this. I said, "Okay, I'll publish it." Mm -hmm. And uh, with Marathon, what happened was. Um, we had offers by three very good publishing houses here in Greece to publish our book. And uh, we settled with what we think is the best, uh, we had the best offer. Uh, it, it's a publishing house called Menandros. We're actually very good friends of the, the publisher. And then I had a third book, which was about um, uh, a, a fighter in the Greek resistance during the, the, the German occupation of Greece during the Second World War, mm -hmm. who was an, Earth officer, an Air Force officer uh, who did major sabotage in, in uh, Athens that was held by the, by the Germans. And that was published by the same publisher who published uh, Marathon. And then uh, the book was translated by a good friend called uh, John Carr, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, I first made his acquaintance because he was writing a book on uh, the Greek Air Force during um, at the beginning of the Second World War, um, when there, there's a war with Italy, 1940 to 41, right. uh, which it's, it, his book is called On Spartan Wings, which is a very good book, incidentally. Um, it was his first book he published with pen and sword. So John uh, translated uh, the, uh, our book, our Greek book, into English. Of course, I edited it first because this was huge. I mean, um, we're talking the Greek book had something like two, two and a half thousand footnotes, oh. <laughs> uh, 800 items. Uh, and of course, it had to be sized down for the English edition. Okay. And John then introduced us to, to Pen and Sword. So not only didn't ha I have any difficulty, I mean, I must be one of the few lucky authors. I'm not like a famous author. It's coincidences that I've never knocked on a, uh, on a publisher's uh, door. Okay. Uh, they come along. Which is okay. It's <laughs> it's, a, it's it's a nice feeling. I, I I don't want to say that again. I'm 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 the, a great author or this and that. But mm -hmm. you know, I hear from friends that um, well, you know, to try to find a publisher, etc. So mm -hmm. okay, you know, Good. that's it <laughs> about the publishers, uh, Chris. Interesting. Um, yeah. Do you have a current writing project you're working on or planning on? Yes, I do. Yeah. Which is with pen and sword. Mm -hmm. I think I can, I can reveal this since um, I mean we've uh, and I'll be writing a book with John Carr. Uh, this is not going to be a translation of a Greek book. It's going. We're actually writing it in English. We have started writing it, mm -hmm. 
And it's about uh, Philip, um, um, the Duke of Edinburgh, okay. his early years, because uh, as you probably know, he's um, uh, of the ex uh, Greek royal family. He used to be a, a, a king in Greece, and Philip is um, belongs to that family. I mean, um, people know, know him as uh, Philip of Greece, mm -hmm. even though he wasn't Greek in the sense that I mean, his parents, his family were not Greeks, but they were uh, the reigning uh, family of Greece, and uh, uh, we've, there's you know interesting uh, things about him as when he was uh, a young uh, child uh, in Greece. So um, we started writing this book, okay. uh, which uh, hopefully we will finish it in um, in the current year. Okay. It's not like marathon, which took me eight years to write. <laughs> okay, no, yeah, this one will be a lot quicker. <laughs> Yeah, and the good thing is, of course, I cooperated with John. As I told you, uh, we were friends with John before he started translating uh, Marathon, mm -hmm. because I gave him uh, every, uh, information about the Greek Air Force mm -hmm. during the Second World War. But, of course, his book doesn't cover the entire Second World War. It's 40 to 41 during the the, the, the war with the Italians. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how I met John. Then John uh, translated Marathon. And we had a, a close cooperation with, with the translation because I had to, to edit things out uh, of, from the Greek edition. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this will be our first book, which will be written uh, uh, in, in English. As I told you, it's people a bit taken aback. My books are on completely different uh, fields because I happen to make, to make discoveries in these fields. So, uh, I mean, there's no connection uh, between them. Where can people find your work uh, on the web? Do you have social media or website? Uh, well, I don't have a website. I think that's it. Uh, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm not really into so social uh, media. Okay. Uh, my co-author is more so sociable uh, mm -hmm. on the yeah. internet. Huh. Um, so, but people can find the book on like, Amazon and no, other... No, no, the book, no, no. no. Well, I mean, the book is um, actually... It's by uh, the, the publisher is Pen and Sword. It's... Mm -hmm. uh, or not all Amazons. I mean, I uh, can see that um, uh, most uh, big uh, bookshops uh, actually uh, advertise it. I mean, Waterstones, W.H. Smiths. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a big uh, bookstore in uh, the United States. Um, uh, I think it's called Barnes and um, Barnes and Noble. Yep. Yeah, Barnes and Noble also advertise the book. So if someone wants to find the book, uh, they can either find it through Pen and Sword or you know the major bookstores. Mm -hmm. uh, or even Amazon. Right. Okay. That's all the questions I have. Do you have any final thoughts or words? Well, um, uh, I think I've you know I've covered a lot of things uh, mm -hmm. on this uh, this uh, interview. It's actually the first interview I'm giving in English on, on, uh. on marathon, and I'm really looking forward to people uh, reading the book uh, because. As I told you, it came out in uh, in Greek, in Greek. But I mean, um, you know, Greece, a small country, few people. Mm -hmm. um, generally, it did get good reviews. But I'm waiting um, with uh, excitement uh, to hear uh, comments by people that will read the book, mm -hmm. uh, critics. And um, uh, since it will be in English, uh, there's going to be a much much larger audience mm -hmm. uh, about this. And uh, of course, marathon is uh, famous. And um, the, the competition, marathon competition, is not, nothing more than a small detail about a major event, which was the battle. And uh, you've got millions of people that participate in, uh, the, in marathons uh, all around the world. And I think it's a good thing to find out that there's, there was also the battle. That, that's the reason why they, they, they run uh, the marathon. Mm -hmm. And as I told you, you, hundreds of people did research about, about the battle. Incidentally, it's one of the one of the reasons was that we don't have uh, a coherent, uh, uh, detailed uh, description of the battle. Yeah, everyone knows that Herodotus wrote about the battle, but mm -hmm. uh, his description of the battle was very brief. It was because um, uh, the Battle of Marathon was not one of his main uh, points he was making, because uh, Herodotus was uh, concert his theme, the topic of his um, his book was Xerxes' uh, invasion, hmm. and Marathon is before Xerxes' invasion. So it was something like in, in his introduction to what happened next. And we have all these publications, and uh, you know our book comes out, and uh, 
and uh, we hope that uh, we've um, come up with answers to many uh, questions that people had mm -hmm. about the, the battle. And, uh, you know, they can check out all the evidence and uh, hopefully they can come in uh, to Greece and even visit the battlefield oh, and yeah. try to form uh, their, their own opinion. So I'm looking forward especially to people who tell me that, okay, you're, you're wrong about this. Because this is something that um, I, I didn't encounter uh, here in, in Greece w when my book came up. You know, someone coming along and telling me, okay, I agree with this, but I disagree with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, people either said, okay, we agree with everything, or simply said, simply said well, we don't care about it. Yeah. <laughs> It doesn't mean that everyone cares about, you know, ancient uh, history. Okay? Yeah. But plenty do. Plenty do. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, plenty, plenty do. Yes, yes. All right. Well, thank you for speaking with me. Well, well thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for listening. You can find more podcasts like this on your favorite podcast feed under the title Military History Inside Out. That includes Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. One great way to support me is to rate my podcasts, either good or bad. You can find more great military history information at warscholar.org, on YouTube at warscholar1945, on Facebook at warscholar, on Instagram at Chris Alvarez Warscholar, and on Twitter at warscholar. Please support me by following me on those sites and liking my videos. If you like to read, don't forget to sign up for my weekly newsletter where I recommend newly published books. The subscription box is on my webpage. Thank you.